The final presentation in this uh, this session is um, is, is it working? By can you hear me, Dr. Greg Chu, who yeah, can you hear me? Is yes. going to be talking about uh, assessing and managing risks in project or risk. And uh, Greg uh, is uh, has a PhD from Stanford and a master's from Columbia. Um, he's presently professor of practice with the offshore. Technology and Management Program in the School of Engineering Technology at AIT. Right, so I have, to, I have 10 minutes because there's coffee break at 3 o'clock, right? The shorter the better, Greg. Right, so any questions? <laughs> if not, coffee break, thank you very much. And you're welcome to take the stage and begin your presentation now, thank you. No, Great no, I, I don't like using the stage. Uh, do we have a pointer? Anybody got a pointer? You're fine, you can do whatever you like. Yeah. Oh, sh oh wait a minute, we don't have a remote switcher, do we? Is this, this is also a remote switcher? No. Yeah, so if you go up to the top and you go view and full screen, I'll be fine. I guess I need to sit there and have this. Uh, is, is this a remote mouse? Is this a remote mouse? Can change? Can go forward? Oh, hi, okay, thanks. Oh, great, funny mouse. Uh, liberated. Do you want me up on the stage? I don't like being on stages and talking into a microphone. It makes me, it makes me feel uh, whatever. But anyway, I'm gonna talk to something very dear to my heart, and that is money. I like money. And I, I understand that the breakdown today is about 50% directors, vice presidents and managers, and about another 50% technical people. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to change the tenure, or the pace of this, pres of this gathering today, and we're going to talk about the idea of making money on risk management consulting services. Um, so what, let's start. We talk about structural engineering. I'm originally a structural engineer. I was born and trained as a, as a structural engineer. We talk about risk management as a, as a practice sector. And then I want to talk a little bit about AEC and tie all of this together, especially in the context of what we do at AIT and within the context of how the business may or may not change, which will affect your careers. Now, the senior guys, you're going to be looking to transition your, your companies over to the junior guys. And you junior guys, you're gonna be sitting there taking a, trying to find clients and customers to last for another 20 or 30 years. And this is gonna be a problem. This is gonna be a problem for a few reasons. Part of the problem is that the nature of consulting engineering is changing. And we are becoming more of technologists rather than professionals. And this, is, and this needs to be addressed, and which hopefully that will try to address some of the issues here today. Okay, any questions and just yell out that you have a question. If you want me to, I can condense this down to five minutes and we can get out of here on time, okay? So first, we're gonna talk about structural engineering as background, especially in terms of conventional structural engineering and, and the ideas of professional services and education. I know when I, was, when I was in university, I had no clue what happened in a design office. And then I went into a design office and it, it, it was totally unrelated to classroom learning as far as the actual practice of engineering went. Traditional, our traditional engineering services, we prepare, we prepare contract documents. We have drawings, we have specifications, we have a contract. <clears throat> we have engineering reports, they can be forensic reports, they can be condition surveys, they can be performance reports, and we charge money for it, right? Our business model is we sit down with a client the client says they want a scope of work. We agree to a scope of work, we execute our deliverables, we invoice the client, and sometimes we get paid, right? <laughs> sometimes we don't get paid. <laughs> and sometimes you're chasing your client for five years. <laughs> and uh, do we have any architects in the room? Any architects? No architects, good. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, my, see, see, I, I, I was born in a very healthy family. My father's from Singapore, I was born in Hawaii. And one of the things that my father taught me was I, I was raised in a, in a house with no racial prejudice. But I have a very bad attitude towards lawyers and architects. Um, <laughs> so what we do is we hope to get paid. On, now, how do we start into our professional life? The, the, this is our profession. This is, how we, this is how we make our living. And we enter into our profession by a degree requirements, basic, basic sciences. We go on to engineering sciences. We go on to engineering design. And that's our fourth year. We graduate with a degree, right? After we have graduated with a degree, we think we're the greatest thing on earth in a design office. Then you find out that your draftsman knows more about engineering than you do. Uh, and, you find, and you have to go through the process of professional requirements. So we have a degree from a recognized university. <coughs> we have a list of projects for which, you're the for which you are the responsible engineer. <coughs> you go for licensure and charter from some form of governing agency. And then you begin your practice as a structural engineer, or civil, whatever engineer discipline you're in. <clears throat> Think about this. I started doing this many years ago. Um, my father started doing it even more years ago. And so I can, I can say with confidence, and since 1952, and before that, since my father was <clears throat> um, a consulting engineer, we haven't changed much. The services we offer and the business model that we have has not changed. <laughs> the engineering content for a bachelor's degree in consulting in engineering, mechanical, electrical, civil, hasn't changed either. Our apprenticeship and requirements of practice haven't changed. <clears throat> and that's for at least 60 years, if not more. Right? Our tools have changed. Our superstar structures have changed, right? But not, our 95% of our job is not superstar structures. Not many of us work to get to work on Burj Khalifa. Not many of us get to work on Petronas Towers. Not many of us get to work on Taipei 101. Most of us will work on five to 10 story buildings, extremely boring, 20 story buildings. You can do that in your sleep, right? It hasn't changed. So what is professional structural engineering today? What is it? <clears throat> our bachelor's curriculum, our professor licensure, <clears throat> basically we now we have a commoditization of analysis and design or, or where our engineering judgment and the field for structures often is not learned by our junior engineers much anymore. <clears throat> I know that when I was doing, when I first started off practicing structural engineering, <clears throat> my, my friend became moment distribution. Okay. That was my friend, Hardy Cross. Right? I could do this on the back of an envelope. I could do it very quickly in the field. I could take a look at a structure and have a feel for how the structure would displace. I can have a feel for how the structure's loads would carry down to the soil, to the foundation. And part of my, part of my learning, part of, part of my apprenticeship, was learning how structures feel. We have changes in knowledge. We have computational mechanics. We have our good friend, Dr. Panchet. Where's Dr. Panchet? Oh, uh, Dr. Panchet, who I think you heard this morning. He's a superstar. He follows in, the, in a very long uh, tradition of AIT computational mechanics people. I see Dr. Poe there, who followed, uh, and he's following Dr. Warsop. We have visualization operations and maintenance, building BIM. And BIM started off, oh gosh, 20 years ago, 30, how old am I now? I started off as a research project in about 1990, 1990 and it's now being commercialized, it's being commercial use. We have mathematical constructs, probability and risk, which are my favorite subjects. Structural condition and integrity assessment, my favorite subject. Performance-based design, which is Dr. Panung's, part of Dr. Panung's uh, bag of tricks. And then we have integration among disciplines. Okay, so our tools are better. The tools that we have to use are better. But does the educational process and the apprenticeship process 
and the professional requirements of what we do as practicing engineers always require better tools. And how do we integrate our knowledge and tools to make more money? Because if I understand correctly, <clears throat> most of you are being squeezed like how I was squeezed. The clients kept on demanding lower fees. Right? They, you, you sit there and you say, well, my fees are $1,000. They don't say, I'll give you $1,500. They say, no, can you make it $750, right? And this is a problem. We have better tools. We haven't learned how to, we haven't learned how to use them as to uh, obtain a premium for our professional services. The, the, this is Yankee Stadium in New York City. The cost of construction was, a, or the cost of the project was about one billion US dollars. <clears throat> no longer do we have, for Yankee Stadium, when they did shop drawings, the, sh the design drawings went from the design office to the fabricator. And from the fabricator, <clears throat> it went to the field. So every single bolt hole and every single weld was right on exactly where it was supposed to be. When they did the slotted connections, there's, there's some slotted connections floating around here somewhere. Uh, when they did the slotted connections, all of the parts fit. Before BIM, you would always have to have some field adjustments. Yankee Stadium went up on time, on schedule, uh, and the, the owners, the New York Yankees, have a wonderful model for which they can maintain Yankee Stadium for the next 30, 40 years. They update, they update the database for various, for various components within Yankee Stadium. So when they laid out Yankee Stadium, you know, it, it was a wonderful project, it was a lot of fun. But this is just one example of the tools that we have available to us. So what is another tool? Another tool is risk management. Now, Dr. Panung is an expert on risk, um, right? Okay. That, that, is that a probabilistic or deterministic statement? Okay. Uh, risk management as a practice sector. Risk, risk management is dear and near to me. And now all of you do it, and you've all been introduced to it, I think, in this, in this morning sessions. Dr. Panong is, you've heard him speak many times, and you also heard Dr. Naveed speak many times on the ideas of wind, earthquake, uh, loads, uncertainty and loads. That's wonderful. <clears throat> Your client's not going to pay for it any more than he's paying you now, right? So what you want to do is say, can I offer additional engineering services? Or can I sit there and get a premium on the engineering services that I deliver based on risk management? That's what I like to talk about. I, after, after I finished my third degree, my doctorate, I had a choice. I could either work as an assistant professor somewhere, or I could work for the United States insurance industry. The United States insurance industry's salary was 100% more than the university and I got another 30% as an expense account. So obviously, I went to work for the insurance industry. I like the idea of flying around in private jets. Um, <clears throat> so with defined risk management, we have probabilistic information. We do a risk assessment. Dr. Panong will sit there and can teach you all about risk assessment. And the thing is, you have operational and financial decisions. So we talk about optimal decisions within uncertainty. What does all this mean? All this means is that you provide a set of options based on probabilities. You state, your, you state your options with uncertainty to your client, and you tell your client you can either pay for option one, option two, or option three. Very similar to performance-based engineering. But quantify it, make it technical, present it to your client as a technical service that your firm offers and charge a premium for it. You know. We know a probabilistic hazard identification analysis. We know how to relate vulnerability to hazard, determine risk as a probability of loss. The big question is, and the most difficult question is, the most difficult problem we have as practicing engineers is converting engineering options into dollars. In other words, we're going to sit there and say, Mr. Client, Mr. Mr. Miss Client, option one is going to cost you X dollars first cost. We have a poor time of explaining to the client 
the costs, benefits of option one, option two, and option three. Now, what do I mean by risk? The statement of risk for me, this is Dr. Gregg's statement. This is my own personal statement. And you're going to find this not, you're not going to find many people that present the statement of risk this way. Most, uh, but however, financial people, financial people love this because they love money and they love probability and they understand time. Okay, so we have three components. We have component of dollars, we have components of probability, and we have components of time. If we're missing any one of those components, then it's not a complete statement of risk. Okay. So for example, the probability of a $5 million gain over 10 years is 0.7. So what happens if I take away the probability? I can say that there's a chance of a $5 million gain over 10 years. Well, if my probability is 70%, that might be a good thing. If my probability is 1%, I'm going to have to sit there and rethink my, rethink my options, right? The same thing, losses, Dr. Panung's specialty. The question is, you can talk about a $100 million loss over 25 years. Well, that's fine, but is the probability 0.1, in which case I'm not going to worry too much about it, or is my probability 0.9, in which case I'm going to definitely worry about it. Right? Same thing is if I delete my dollars and I say you have a 10% chance of a loss over 25 years. Yeah, 10% chance of losing to what? One dollar? If I'm going to lose one dollar, I'm not going to worry about it. If I'm going to lose $100 million, I will worry about it. Okay? So I need three components to my statement of loss. Now, this gives you an advantage. If you can sit there and explain this to financial clients or to any developer, government agency, anybody that's a client to you, that you can present your, your statements. And you apply risk management. How do you apply it? We have it in terms of high seismic risk, bridges, waterfront structures, when you either do your original design or, your po or condition assessment. Okay, now I love condition assessment. Because the things that I have to have for condition assessment, the, the structure has been in service for five to 25 years. It's been through a few earthquakes, it's been aged, I've had a few overloaded trucks going over it. <clears throat> so the owner comes to you and says, what's the condition of my structure? And I say, oh, I'm gonna charge you lots of money to tell you the answer to three simple questions. And the three simple questions you wanna answer or you're going to tell the owner, the client, how much money the old client's going to spend. Okay, Mr. Client, I'm going to do my risk assessment, my condition assessment, and you're going to have to spend $100 million. You're going to have to spend it on certain items for design and continued maintenance and upgrading. And you're going to have to spend it in the next five years. And if you want the answer to these three questions, I can give them to you. In statements of probability and uncertainty, it's a statement of risk, and you're gonna pay me a lot of money for it. Because if you don't pay me the money, then I'm not gonna tell you. And this is, a, this is where you can, again, market the services to say that this is a premium. Now, what, what is the difference? The difference is the option is to follow the standard condition surveys that are specified by the government, by some code, by some national standard, by some professional engineering society, right? But once you sign there and sign off on the professional engineering society or the code, the owner still does not know what the probability is of failure or damage or collapse of their facility over the next 25 years. You've gone through a checklist. I can go through a checklist for highways. I can go through a checklist for bridges. I can go a checklist for Dr. Panung's class. And I can say, yes, it satisfies the checklist or it does not satisfy the checklist. And it will cost you $10 million to upgrade your structure to satisfy the checklist. That doesn't tell me what is the useful life, the continued service life of the facility. However, if you sit there and you combine the answer to these three questions with the statement of risk, that's a premium that's something else people, other people don't do. 
So our deliverables, we have a condition, we have a condition statement, a probabilistic statement, options, and send an invoice. Don't forget to get paid. Yeah? Make sure your client pays you up front. If they don't want to pay you for this stuff, give them a sample report and say, this is what you could have got. You know, charge a lot of money also for the, for the, before you start work. Yeah. Um, classical methods, future structural engineering education. Um, I think what the, the most important thing about here is where we want to mentor young engineers. When we mentor young engineers today, for, as, we, as we transition ownership of the company, transition the operational, the design requirements and the analysis requirements, instead of con continuing the process that we've used for the last 70 years, we need to start integrating not only the tools. I mean, the tools just help us do our computations faster. They don't make us any smarter. They don't change the way we think. Just because we can do a faster analysis doesn't make us a better engineer. Uh, what we can do is say, let's include risk as something that we can transfer to the next generation, both educationally and as a, as a form of practice. Uh, I wanted to go off to the AEC for a little bit, but I want to I want to get to coffee because I'm because I need I need some coffee. Uh, do we have any? How many non ties do we have here? Non ties. Oh, okay. But how many non AEC or how many non ASEAN countries? Okay, so we have a handful of non ASEAN countries. Okay, let's. What well, the purpose of this was to say. In Thailand, we, as you know, the AEC, the ASEAN Economic Community, is supposed to occur in two years. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about engineers moving around this community and saying, well, how do engineers practice? And part of the practice is that we're going to say that we have a government, we have something in the government that regulates professional engineers. We have some kind of um, engineering association of engineering societies. So we have a national recognition, we have mutual recognition, and this is probably one of the most interesting items, is that currently, for civil engineers, non-Thais are prohibited from practicing as civil engineers in Thailand. Okay. That's a law. Now, each country in, the, in ASEAN is allowed to implement AEC as it deems appropriate. Each country makes its own regulations. And these are Thailand's regulations for the current practice of civil engineering. <coughs> but, so if we sit there and say, take a look at what is required, we say that a registered foreign professional engineer will be permitted to work in independent practice, blah, blah, blah shall not be eligible to work in independent practice in the host country unless specifically permitted by host ASEAN country. This is from ASEAN. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Why do I have it up here? The reason I have it up here is because we've heard a lot about integration of engineering practice in regions. And what I'm saying here, five minute buzzer. I can do it in two. I can do it in one minute. OK. So what, we can, what we're saying here is that, in general, we're going to take a look at regional integration of engineering, the practice of engineering. But it's not going to happen. So does AEC really have an effect as an engineer? So the question is, does AEC dramatically affect the practice of engineering in Thailand, or Singapore, or Indonesia, or Malaysia? And actually, it won't, okay. because of the implementation. <clears throat> now, this goes back to risk management. How are we going to go back to risk management? We're going to say that the AEC will affect regional practice of engineering somehow. We all think that this is an opportunity, and we're all going to explore opportunities. Well, in addition to risk management as a practice, we're going to sit there and say that the risk management of knowledge across our country boundaries, the things that Dr. Panung and Dr. Panchet and, um, and Dr. Poi teach so well, is that the need 
for you as consulting engineers to keep in the back of your mind the various levels of hazards, vulnerabilities that are local to each community. When you take a look at their building codes, building conditions, how you develop a, develop a facility. And this is also something you can use to make money. Right? You have to be aware of the local practice and when you, when you go across the border or the border comes across to you, you can sit there and manage, manage your projects. As Dr. Naveed invited you and you get free lunch. At least that's the only reason I came. I came to eat lunch. But AIT's integration technology and regional needs, there's some things that AIT does very well, very, very well. And those things are that what we, te what we do at AIT is very relevant. It's relevant to the practice of engineering. It's relevant to the future of engineering and development of a region. Okay? The other thing is it's very practical. Dr. Naveed, Dr. N Dr. Doc, Doc, uh, what's, it, what's this guy's name? Uh, uh, what's your name? No, not Panchet, uh, the other guy. Penang, ah, yeah, Dr. Penang. Uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're very practical people, you know. And we, imp we have an international character, we're state-of-the-art, consideration of communities' needs. <clears throat> At AIT, the reason you're here today is to take a, to listen to some of the aspects of where our profession, where our engineering, where our technology and management and development is going in the future and what we're doing to study about it and how we can sit there and convey to you some of that knowledge. Okay? Um, I'm a civil engineer. I'm registered in the state of California. Civil and structural engineering design, <coughs> finance and insurance. I love money. Money, money was good to me. Um, probabilistic loss estimation, and I'm currently a professor of practice at AIT. Thank you. <laughs>